There's some old pictures there, that's for sure. Uh, good evening. I have a higher power, and I call us Jesus Christ. He calls me forgiven, loved, redeemed, and wonderfully made. I am celebrating recovery over living in darkness for 47 years, and I struggled with drug and alcohol addiction, and my name is Tom. Hi, Tom. I am happy and grateful to be here, and halfway through the story, you'll probably realize why I'm so grateful to be here, uh, to be able to share a little bit of my story with you. As you heard, I lived in the dark for 47 years. For the record, I have only been a believer for nine years, five months, and seven days, and yes, I count. <laughs> the fact that I know how long I've been a believer should already tell you that I had a very memorable experience, one that changed my life forever, and one that I'm eternally grateful for. I am sure there were several straighter roads that I could have traveled to come to Jesus, but I took Tom's highway and arrived much later than I should have but I thank God every day because I finally came to believe. So in order to do this right, I'm gonna to have to tell you what I was like, what happened, and how I got here today. So we get started. What I was like. I was born in Massachusetts in the early 60s, and just so that there's no questions here, that fact makes me a New England Patriots fan by birth. <laughs> uh, uh, and since I'm not in denial, I'm still a fan, so. <laughs> Uh, I believe I had a normal childhood. I'm the second of four brothers with a baby sister that came along late in life. I had two parents, a stay-at-home mom, and a father that spent time with us and was all involved in our activities like Boy Scouts, hockey, fishing, hunting. Uh, we went to church regularly, but I never remember feeling or even believing any of it was real. They talked about God and Jesus in church, but I just didn't buy it. What I knew was we had to sit up straight no horse playing, get to the right page, follow along with the service. It was more of some kind of ritual than just something that had to be done. And I'm not putting blame on the church here, it's just, it just wasn't real for me. My early childhood was uneventful, but as I grew into my teen years, I believe there came a separation of who I was and what I wanted others to see. I think the best explanation of the separation that I ever heard was that we split into two people. And, uh, I heard that called as one's called character man and the other one's called reputation man. Uh, this happened to me when I began comparing myself to who I am on the inside to what I saw on the outside of others. It's a dangerous place to go and it only leads to fear and insecurity. I felt I had to mask who I really was and how I really felt. I wanted everyone to see me in a way that I projected rather than who I really was. In hindsight, I can see how that started me on a road that gradually led me downhill and eventually over a cliff. It was then during my teen years that I discovered an easy way, I call it a mask, that could transfer me from character man, who I was, into reputation man, who I wanted others to see. So when I began experimenting with drugs and alcohol, I ran into and personally met the most wonderful, perfect, fearless, funny, confident, powerful person there ever was, me. <laughs> <laughs> a drink or a drug took away any insecurity or fear. I didn't know it at the time, but I had found a higher power. In high school, I was fairly popular. I played for a hockey team, I hung out with the crowd, I always had a girlfriend, but I was more concerned with what people thought of me. I didn't care about whether something was the right thing to do or the right way to act. I was more in fear of people would discover who I really was or how I really felt. I hid everything in the darkness. I wanted everyone to think I had everything together. Why? Because to me, it looked like everybody else had their stuff together. After high school, I went to college and played for a hockey team. I partied like a rock star, and of course, had trouble making it to classes. To say that my dad was surprised when he saw my grades would be a gross understatement. <laughs> Needless to say, my college career only lasted a year. Looking back, I can see how I was progressing in my addictions, habits, hangups. Because at college, and being away from home, I found it easier to wear the mask and be whoever I wanted others to think I was. When college didn't work out, I had to try something else, so long as that something else didn't involve coming to grips with who I really was. So, I joined the Navy. I traveled to many countries and continued to work on my PhD in drinking heavily and acting like a fool. After five years, I got married, had four wonderful children, and maintained a life that didn't include God. 
Again, I didn't hate God. I just denied that he existed. I never had a need for God. I could do everything I needed to do. I could be anyone I wanted to be. I know now that I was living in denial. I eventually got out of the Navy with 14 years of service. And without the military structure guiding my life, I began to cross more lines that aren't meant to be crossed. In business, I was financially successful, but I had no problem cheating, lying, deceiving to get ahead. The more financially successful I became, and the more I wanted, and the more I believed it was all about me and that I was all powerful. I don't know if I told you this, but I was real smart. <laughs> and of course, this is the Tom that I wanted everyone to see. You know, the successful young family guy with a big house, toys, money, blah, blah, blah. Not who I really was. I could not let anybody know the real Tom. Inside, I was an empty person, gripped with fear of being exposed for who I really was. As time went on, I separated from my wife, abandoned my children more than once. At the time, I was working in real estate and construction and was making more money than ever before. I even went and bought a strip club where I was living in Virginia Beach. This way, I could make my reputation man look even better. I drank heavily, used cocaine, women, gambling, and material possessions to try and fill the emptiness inside me. On the outside, I thought I looked great, and I really believed everyone else saw the image I was projecting. There's a word for that. It's called delusional. <laughs> my cocaine use and lack of character led me to a partial crash in Virginia, and I decided to move to Florida in 2001. You know, the old geographical change, that'll fix it. I've refrained from drug use, but I continued to drink while I began life over again. I worked harder and smarter, and because of my experience in real estate and construction, coupled with the rising values of real estate at that time, it only took me a few years before I was financially su successful again. I became another giant in my own mind. And just like the past, I began to feel all-powerful with a huge ego and wanted to prove to the world that I was the most wonderful, perfect, fearless, funny, confident, powerful person there ever was. That's right. I put my mask back on and used all my old habits to tra transform me back into reputation man. When we had a real estate slowdown that eventually turned into a crash. Now the good part. What happened? Well, as you might have guessed already, a common result of destructive behavior is a crash. Not the real estate crash, but a personal one. And I eventually crashed. Between 2007 and 2008, I was arrested and put into drug court for possession of stolen property and some bad check charges. I had trouble accepting the fact that I used to be able to write a $25,000 check without even thinking. But now I had trouble keeping $25 in my, in my checking account. In case you didn't know this, but heavy drug use and all-round foolishness gets quite expensive. I kept violating drug court conditions and kept on getting rearrested. I was digging a ditch. I kept digging and digging a deeper ditch. But that was my life then. Chance after chance, I kept digging. I was hopeless. Then I got a bright idea to help increase my income. So I became 25 different doctors and started writing prescriptions for pain pills so that I could sell them or trade them for other drugs. And in case you're wondering, I never went to medical school. So <laughs> my, my scheme worked for a little while, and it was great money. I thought I was a genius, and I had an easy life figured out. Wrong again. I violated drug court probation for the last time, and was arrested on August 3rd, 2008. That's my sobriety date. And for any other red, white, and blue Patriot fan out there, you also know that that's Tom Brady's birthday. <laughs> so. I knew this was huge. I got arrested on Brady's birthday and something big was getting ready to happen. So <laughs> I didn't know it yet, but I was heading for a life-changing moment. Uh, I've got a couple of booking pictures if you want to put them up. And yeah, here we are. The, uh, the guy on the far left, that's, uh, that's angry Tom because it was everybody else's fault that, uh, that I was there getting booked. And the guy on the right, that's, uh, that's just straight denial because there was nothing wrong with me in that picture. And uh, the best... The best uh, definition for denial I heard was uh, refusing to believe what you already know. And looking at that, I guess I should have already known. So. Um, so I ended up in the Sarasota County Jail. And over there, there's two sections. The old section is painted blue and is often referred to as the Blue Lagoon. That's where I was housed for the first couple of days. And I was told one morning to roll up my stuff, and I was being moved to the new section of the jail. 
I was a bit confused, but I did as I was told. When I got to the new side of the jail and entered into what is referred to as the God Pod, I was a bit indignant. You know, like, whose silly idea was this? I didn't ask to come here. Well, I was there and decided it looked better on this side of the jail, so, and I, so I stayed. And for once, I made a good decision. Volunteers from the outside would come in and do Bible studies and talk to us. It was a bit strange because my natural reaction was to mock them and believe that they had some nefarious agenda. But over a few weeks, I started to see that wasn't really the case. It was getting pretty hard to not deny their sincerity. A month went by and my head was getting clear and the drug court judge was going to let me go to a treatment program at the Salvation Army. I look back and find it amazing how I could be so happy to live at the Salvation Army. I had lived in some pretty nice places and owned several nice homes in the past, but now I couldn't wait to move into the Salvation Army. I only ended up staying there for a week, but it was a week that I revisit my mind every time I remember, try to re need to remember what it was like. So at the Salvation Army, after a few days of Bible studies, recovery classes, and AA meetings, my denial and hearted heart started to crack. And then one night we had a special speaker, called Mr. David Sutton, who spoke at an evening meeting where hundreds of people from the community came to attend. I don't recall exactly what part of his talk broke me down the most, but I remember that I did not know up from down, and I was no longer confident in anything that I had previously held on to as a strong belief. Something was happening. Now, here's the best part. The next morning, I went out into the parking lot for a walk and tried to clear my head. When I stopped, and I looked up and said, okay, God, if you do exist, and uh, the most wonderful thing happened. By the time the, word, the letter S rolled off my tongue and exists, um, probably, a, I don't know if it was 100, 500, 1,000 different memories of all these different things that happened to me through my life, people that had witnessed to me, people who tried to tell me something. All these memories came through at the same time. And uh, I, I don't know if I was there for 30 seconds or three minutes, but I ended up on my knees calling out to God. I surrendered to him in the parking lot. And um, I knew Jesus loved me. And that, everything that I heard about him was true. Um, you know, I did, uh, I did steps one, two, and three. I, I, you know, I look back at it, and I, you know, I got a big jump on recovery because steps one, two, and three happened in that 30 seconds or 30 minutes. I don't know how long it was, but it happened. Uh, two days later, I was brought back to the jail because the new charges had been filed that related to me writing prescriptions for pain medication. And that's the picture of the one on the right. You know, that's a, those pictures are only a couple months apart, but... Uh, you ever see the, the posters out there where they show people before methamphetamine, after methamphetamine, before crack, after crack? Well, I mean, that's the one before Jesus and after Jesus. And, and uh, that's, that's, that's what it is. Uh. So I spent the next 10 months in the county jail, first in the God pod, and then in a recovery pod, which they called the odd pod. <laughs> I felt freer than I ever had in my life. I was facing uncertainty about the future, but somehow I knew that everything was going to be all right. And we had several recovery classes every day and worked the steps. Now, just as a, uh, a note here, uh, trying to do a fourth and fifth step in, in a prison while waiting trial is, is a bad time to do that because the last thing you want to do is start confessing to everybody. Um, <laughs> So it, it, it took a couple of years, and when I finally got into prison, I was able to get that part done. But uh, I eventually took a plea deal for 10. <laughs> I had a whole bunch of co-defendants, right? I, I eventually took a plea deal for 10 years in state prison. I remember asking God to take care of my four children and to, to have positive godly influences come into their lives while I was not going to be there, which is really odd because I certainly hadn't been that way myself. In fact, I did more. I did more to keep them from believing a loving God than lead them to. I also asked God to use me to be a positive influence in the lives of others while I was in prison. And I'm sure there was many parents praying for their children that are locked up. And I can tell you, God answered my prayers by watching over the ch my children, and he certainly put me in a position to witness to others. I was trained as a law clerk and worked in prison law libraries of the many institutions that I was sent to. Every new camp that I would arrive at, a new person or persons would be put in my path. I don't have enough time here to explain in details, but uh, I sure have been encouraged by many fellow inmates that I have met and have been a source of encouragement to them. I still write to many of them today, even though many of them will never be released until the day they die. 
But while they are in there, they're living a life that is pleasing to God, and they demonstrate Jesus' life for others. During my time in prison, I was able to take several classes and met many volunteers that gave the time to inmates and programs. If anybody out there goes around and does these things like Kairos and stuff, you're doing a great thing. It's well appreciated by everybody in there. Uh, the fact that I didn't have to keep the lights on or a roof over my family's head allowed me more time to learn God's word and work the steps with other like-minded people. I finally was able to do fourth and fifth steps and the rest of the steps with people that were in there where it wasn't going to uh, where it wasn't going to neg negatively affect me that bad. Um, I was able to go to a program called Bridges of America when I had 17 months left. We had plenty of volunteers that came in and brought 12-step meetings into the program. This included Bridge Builders, which is a Christian-based 12-step program. The last 10 months, I was able to go outside the prison and work at a work release program. And amazingly, I was hired by a criminal post-conviction lawyer as a paralegal and that has made my transition to outside life an easier one. You see, I work for a couple of attorneys today as a subcontractor, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to financially survive while spending plenty of time coming to CRs and recovery meetings and groups everywhere. So what am I like now, and how did I get here? I was released from prison in February of 2017, so I'm, I'm actually one week past one year, and uh, I'm still here. So. <laughs> I came to Englewood and I immediately got involved with a group that was starting to Celebrate Recovery. I think I was there for a week and I went to an AA meeting and a lady looked up at me and says, you know anything about Celebrate Recovery? And uh, it was on. They were just starting a program. So uh, the Englewood United Methodist Church took me in and put me in their leadership team where we went through the steps together and we launched in September. And they even brought me with me, they even brought me with them to California at Saddleback Church for the annual summit. And it was an amazing time being in a room with 3,000 people all singing praises and meeting people all over, all over the country who were involved with CR. And since I've been out, I've finally able to get a real and permanent sponsor. Um, even though I've been through the steps several times, I believe it's so important to live by the principles associated with each step. I still have amends that I'm working on because in many cases my amends list is still not, uh, still not crossed off all the way. Even though I'm willing to make amends, the opportunity has not been there to actually make them all yet. Today, I have several accountability partners because I'm entrenched in the recovery community. I recently joined a small group of men from Englewood and Port Charlotte, and we're doing the Journey Continues, which is the continuation there of the step study. Uh, we have a small number of people that attend the CR in Englewood, and we're preparing for more people to come and get involved. I've been in prison for a little over a year now, and part of my recovery is staying involved and giving away what's been given to me. As I go ahead and draw this to a close, I'd like to summarize what I learned about recovery in a simple way. When I first came to believe and started reading scripture, I came upon a verse that really struck a chord in me. It was simple, it really sums up recovery for me, and I'd like to share it with you. And the verse is John 1, 5, where the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not or didn't understand it, or was powerless over it. I have a brain that needs to conceptualize things, so I actually tested it out, you know, so it actually, it actually, it actually works. You know, it does dispel the darkness. The light has too much power over the darkness. So when I take this verse in conjunction with other verses in the book of John, like John 8, 12, where Jesus told the Pharisees, I am the light of the world. He said, whoever follows me will have the light of life, and will never walk in darkness. Then again, in 1 John 5 through 9, John tells us that the message we have heard from his son and announces this, God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. If then we say that we have fellowship with him, yet at the same time live in darkness, we are lying both in our words and our actions. But if we live in the light, just as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from every sin. What this all means is that when we're in denial, we're keeping something in the dark. Our fears, insecurities, hurts, resentments, all live in the darkness. We as people on our own are powerless over anything in the darkness. The things that we do that we don't want others to know about are done in the darkness. The good news is that God is light. Darkness can only exist in the absence of light. It's absolutely true. That's why we have the steps. We have to get out of our denial. 
believe the light can dispel darkness, and then pull out all the things that we keep in the dark and expose it to the light, which is God. That is why I feel the most liberating, freeing part of recovery is in principle four and step five, when we admit to ourselves, denial, to God, we came to believe, and to another human being. And uh, for sure, two out of three of that doesn't work. James 5.16 says, so then confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you will be healed. Yes, we can be forgiven by confessing to God and asking forgiveness. And then when we confess to another human being we trust, we are healed. That's recovery. And step six and seven, I believe that's where character man reconnects with reputation man. We are ready, and then God removes our shortcomings. We become comfortable about who we really are. It was at this point in my life that I realized it was foolish to hide who I was. God made me. He doesn't make mistakes. He never has, he never will. If I'm shorter than someone, not as fast as someone, not as good looking as someone, or I can't sing as good as someone, etc., etc., how can I be ashamed of who I am? God loves me just the way he designed me. I mean, how awesome is that? All right, well, thank you all for letting me share what Jesus has done for me. And it's my prayer that if you don't know Jesus at this time or have walked away from him, then you have an experience where Jesus comes into your life in a way that cannot be denied. God bless you all and good night. Thank you. Thank you. That's so awesome. Thank you. That's so awesome.